Good morning and welcome to a new week. This is Business Morning. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. I'm Ladi Williams. Let's kick off with the news. Our oil prices fell today and fears of surging COVID-19 cases in India uh, will drive down fuel demand in the world's third biggest oil importer. And as investors adjusted positions ahead of a planned increase in OPEC plus oil output from May. Uh, Brent crude futures dropped 38 cents to $65.73 a barrel following a 1.1% rise on Friday. U.S. West Texas intermediate crude futures were down 31 cents, which is 0.5% lower at $61.83 a barrel. Uh, both benchmarks have fell by about 1% last week. A technical committee meeting is set for today where market fundamentals and comp compliance with production cuts uh, will be discussed. Meanwhile, U.S. energy firm cut the number of oil rigs operating for the first time since March as rigs fell by 1 to 438 last week. And back here in Nigeria, the National Bureau of Statistics has released selected banking sector data for the fourth quarter of 2020. It shows a total volume of over 3.4 billion transactions valued at 356 0.47 trillion naira was recorded in the period as data on electronic payment channels. Online transfers dominated the volume of transactions with about 2.22 billion online transfer transactions valued at 120.27 trillion naira. In terms of credit to the private sector, the total value of credit allocated by the bank stood at 20.37 trillion naira as of the fourth quarter of 2020. Oil and gas and manufacturing sectors got credit allocation of 3.93 trillion naira and 3.19 trillion naira to record the highest credit allocation as at the period on the review. The total number of banks staff decreased by 0.90% on the quarter on quarter from 95.88 in the third quarter of 2020 to 95,026 in the fourth quarter of 2020. And the central bank has been speaking of its intervention to ensure food security as well as uh, reflate the economy following the impact of COVID-19 pandemic across all sectors of the economy. According to the Director of Development Finance, uh, Mr. Yusuf Yila, the latest of such interventions is the disbursement of 35 billion naira to fertilizer blending plants in the country to boost food production. To take a listen. This is a scheme to ensure that uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria provides working capital to support raw materials acquisition by blending plants to guarantee local supply of fertilizers. 35 billion naira has been disbursed to the various fertilizer blending plants in conjunction with the Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority, NSIA. Agri Small and Medium Enterprise Investment Scheme, AXMES. This is a partnership with the Bankers Committee to support agribusiness and SMEs. Over 111 billion has been disbursed to 29,000 beneficiaries as at March 2021. And the sugar industry has been of interest in recent times. So we have the special report which says that about 13 years since the adoption of the Nigeria Sugar Master Plan, less than 5% of sugar is produced locally through the backward integration program. Well, we have the special report to look at how much has been achieved through the public-private partnership in the nation's sugar industry. The quest to achieve 100% self-sufficiency in sugar production gave birth to the Nigerian Sugar Master Plan by the National Sugar Development Council. The master plan is to ensure that local production is raised as well as end the era of importing refined sugar for local consumption, which currently stands at over 1.8 million metric tons yearly. Clearly, not much has been achieved as Nigeria still ranks among the top 10 importers of sugar globally. However, around 30,000 metric tons of Nigeria's annual consumption is produced locally, a far cry from where we hope to be as a nation. Recently, allegations and counter allegations began to make the rounds of a monopoly, price fixing, and artificial scarcity among the industry players. 
Analysts believe this was a major distraction to the objectives of self-sufficiency. You guys are some of the biggest industrialists in the country. You know, bring your expertise, bring your know-how, bring your money into this sector. Let us see how we can conquer it. And the fact that we haven't done so is something that really uh, the Ministry of Trade and Investment needs to look into. The Ministry of Finance, the CBA, need to really come and sit down and find out why this hasn't happened yet because these are some of the biggest players in the game. According to reports by the government, the fiscal incentives are to allow private investors import raw sugar and refine for local consumption as well as other benefits. I start from the social story that we've had, which is refinery, and then I've gone around the three refinery. I'm impressed with what I've seen, and I'm very sure that the same commitment that we put in putting all this refinery in place, we will now transfer the same commitment to backward integration, which require a lot of capital and a lot of land and a lot of commitment. Some of the industrial giants give a hint on how much work has gone into achieving the targets in the master plan. We've developed um, a total of 3,000 hectares. We've built a sugar mill. Um, we built a sugar estate and the infrastructure that comes with that land. Uh, we've invested over 65 billion in that, and we've invested another 200 million dollars in the mill, in the refinery here in Apapa. We have a refining capacity currently of 1.5 million metric tons. Um, with this, when completed, it will increase that to 1.7 million metric tons. The plan is to ensure that for as much as possible, we should be able to provide Nigerians with cheaper alternatives to imported sugar. With the level of engagement, many expect the momentum to be sustained in order to meet local demand as well as make the nation a net exporter of sugar in the future. And now to our first conversation. The federal government has granted Nigeria liquefied natural gas company 20 billionaire tax waiver for the construction of uh, the Bodo Boni Bridge in River State. The executive order signed by the President Mohamedou Buhari in 2020 authorizes companies that provide critical infrastructure like roads to be granted tax waivers. NLNG has so far received uh, three credit certificates in the last three years, valued at about 46 billion naira. The fourth is expected later in the year. And Dangote Nigeria Limited has also participated in infrastructure credit, which offers uh, tax waivers. How popular and impactful is the executive order? Uh, Ms. Mr. Oladipo Ajayi, head fixed income at Chapel Hill Denham, will discuss this and take a look at the markets. Hello, Mr. Ajayi, great to have you. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Rumi. How are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, so uh, Nigeria Liquefied Natural Gas Company, uh, the 20 billion tax waiver for the construction of the Bodo Boni Bridge in River State. Um, looking at this, it looks like a win win uh, situation for NLNG and River State. What's your take? Uh, for me, I think uh, it's a laudable decision. And um, just like what you actually mentioned, it's a win win for both. Uh, LNG and uh, River State, and on the on 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 on, on the fact that um, both are actually beneficiary on the part of LNG, they are able to get the tax waiver, and on the part of River State government, they are also able to get infrastructure um, on on their hand. And uh, the 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 project is a, is a very good one. And um, when when the government started um, this um, project in um, 2019, um, the article was seven. Uh, we all know that um, the government's revenue is doing thing, and as a result, um, most of the uh, revenue are they actually allocated to they are located to um, um, recurrence expenditure. But uh, considering um, um, opportunities like this, this help the government to actually remove the burden of capital uh, expenditures from them, and also push it to more of uh, the corporates. And uh, we think uh, this is a very, very good one. Yeah, but uh, we've heard of NLLG, we've heard of Dangote. One would have expected that, I mean, because of the tax waiver that this comes with, it would be very popular and we will hear of a lot of corporates, you know, that have participated. Or is, are there hurdles that stop other people from participating and, and gaining from this? I think there are other people also in the streamline to also participate in this uh, in this uh, in this PPP project, 
and um, for, for, for a fact, we know very well that a lot of people want to actually see the truthfulness of the government around this. And um, with what people are saying around uh, what, the way the government and the LNG and Dangote, um, on, on, on the Dangote project, the one at Obachana and um, the one at um, um, Apaposha, the expressway, it, um, it's a very good one for, for most people and they will actually want to do the same line because it's a very great opportunity. Aside the fact that you get a tax waiver, it's also a very good way to actually write your name in the hearts of people. And it's a very good uh, CSR uh, project for some of, those, uh, some of these organizations. All right, let's uh, take a look at the markets. Last week, the equities market had five uh, positive sessions, uh, bargain hunting and the banking encounters. What do you think um, motivated investors this time? I think uh, it's more of a, a time for Q1 um, results. And uh, a lot of people are actually trying to front run the market around that. And also, some people are actually uh, at the back, on the back of the results released, and um, a lot of people are also actually um, actually taking a um, position around the results. Um, as much as we know that the market is down, there are also some names that you want to actually cherry pick in the market. Um, over the weekend, we had the Dan Gothen mention that um, the demand, um, they, they have over demand uh, of about 40%. So when you have, uh, when organizations like that need to increase um, capacity to actually meet demand, it also sounds good that um, there will be a, lot, a very good revenue from such organizations and uh, maybe by the end of the year, their performance can actually um, outweigh what they actually reported last year. However, we still feel that um, um, the equity market is still not a, a very, very bright um, um, opportunity now. Considering that we know fully well that um, the fixed income space um, yields are actually going up, and as a result, that's also a deterrent to a lot of um, uh, portfolio managers to actually be more active in their equity space. Mm. So, you, like you mentioned, the earnings season for the first quarter of 2021 begins. What's your outlook for that? We, well, he, for what, if you look at the year, um, it's not been a very um, extraordinary year. Um, some, some of the uh, organizations, like maybe the banks, uh, were able to actually pull a very good results. Um, however, um, on, on, the, on the other side, there are some, or some other companies on the, in the market that will find it very difficult to actually repeat uh, what it did last year. So it's, it's going to be a mixed result, and they will see it coming out. We saw some of the results we lost the last year. We saw Stambik and uh, it came short uh, of our expectations. Um, so it's going to be like that in, in the market throughout, uh, throughout the, uh, this quarter. Uh, we're going to see results that will actually wow us and we're going to see results that we feel that um, is not so attractive enough uh, compared to our expectation. So what we're expecting um, for this quarter will be more of a mixed result than um, a, um, a bright result. All right. At, at the bonds market, yields adjusted to the higher stop rates at uh, Wednesday's uh, federal government uh, bond auction. What direction do you expect uh, yields to take? Yeah, um, in the short run, um, what we're looking at for this week, we'll, we'll likely see a lot of activity in the bond space. And um, that is premised on, on the level of liquidity that we're expecting in the system. Um, for bond payments on three maturities uh, between today and tomorrow, we're expecting um, about 160 billion to hit the system. And um, some of this fund will go back to the bond space. And uh, as a result of that, uh, we feel that um, PMs will go around market share picking and we feel that will, will help the market for, for, for this week. And uh, also on Wednesday, there will be NCB auction. Tomorrow we are we are expecting over 100 billion maturity from, OMO, from the OMO market and uh, um, I would think that will also help the market as well and also we are expecting about 321 billion from um, from fact payments for this for this month we hit the system and um, with the level of liquidity that we're expecting uh, we expect market to actually react positively however considering the action um, antecedents of the um, of the monetary policy guys in, in the recent part Pass. We might likely see the CBM be, be, become more active and uh, more aggressive this week to actually mop the liquidity in the system. But however, if the, system, the CBM allows the liquidity to actually stay a bit in the system, we will see a more of a very bullish market. But if, on the other hand, the CBM decides to be extremely aggressive, 
uh, we actually see more of uh, more like a flat um, uh, fixed income market for this week. So what, what does the inflation rate have to do with this? I mean, we're dealing with 18 plus percent now. What impact does it have? Of course, uh, anybody that wants to invest in a long, long dated instrument, you want to look at uh, what could be going to be your real return. And if you look at the way inflation has been behaving, um, I think um, the behavior has been rational. And as a result, investors are looking for opportunities that can actually help them to actually um, give them a, a positive real return. But to speak now, um, uh, a lot of investment to the market, they are, they are still uh, giving a negative real return. Uh, uh, maybe the equity market would have been a solace, but uh, as we speak, uh, still not a, a clear and a good to go area as we speak now. However, there are, like I mentioned sometimes, that there are other instruments in the market um, maybe um, that will give you um, better than what we are getting in the fixed income market now. Um, and I think um, investors will actually have to look around that to actually find a way to actually uh, reduce their negative real return. Now, what, what, sorry, what are some of those? You said there are other instruments. I mean, some people will be curious, as in, can you give us which of this other way we could go? Uh, okay, for example, in, uh, in Chapoe, we have uh, our NDIS, NDI, uh, NIDF fund. NIDF fund is benchmarked around a 10-year uh, FGM return plus 4 to 500 basis point return. So what that means is that if a 10-year instrument is showing 13%, the return you get from an ID investing in uh, an Chapel year NIDF fund is about 17 to 18%. So if you are getting 17% return on your investment, it's very close to the 18.1%. Um, that's currently the inflation figure is giving you. So your negative real return is reduced at least to a PRS minimum or uh, maybe if not fully covered. All right, so last week, the, the Treasury bill's secondary market remained bearish following the persistent uh, illiquidity in the interbank market. Uh, what do you envisage uh, demand will be this week? Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I said we expect a lot of liquidity to hit the system this week. So we feel that will affect the um, treasury uh, market positively. However, on Wednesday, when there's going to be an auction, if you look at the past uh, LTB auction, we'll see rates move um, north on the long end, uh, that means on the 364 day bill. So same thing, market might likely be expecting the same thing to actually happen uh, for this auction. But uh, on my own part, I think uh, if rate is moving up this auction, I don't expect the rate to move above uh, 9.5. And one of my reasons for thinking that is currently the OMO rate is at 10.1 for the same maturity. And that uh, when you move it to be closer to um, the OMO rate, um, then the, the OMO, OMO view uh, would might not likely achieve the main reasons why uh, the CBN is actually issuing that instrument. But one of the uh, reasons for issuing OMO B is to much more liquidity from the system. And when you're doing that, the market sees you as being very aggressive as a result, the market wants a better return than what, than what they would get on the normal NTB, uh, NTB option. So if we, the GMO finally moved rates, um, maybe uh, closer, maybe to 10%, what that means is that the market will likely, uh, maybe the FPM will likely be asking for more rates on the OMO front. All right, looking at the equities market, what counter do you see, you know, getting more attention and demand this week? Come again, please. As I'm looking at the equities market, what counter uh, do you see getting more demand uh, this week? I, I think uh, getting more demand is premised on the result that will likely come out of the market this week. If, um, if we see very good results of the market, there's yeah, very active, there's a very good uh, chance that we'll see a lot of activities on, around, around the market. But if the market is not um, showing out good results for this week, we might actually see more like a, a flat or a regressive market this week. All right, Mr. Ladipo um, Ajayi, the head of fixed income at Chapel Hill Denham, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us this Monday morning and thank enjoy you. the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The World Bank estimates that businesses lose $29 billion yearly to poor electricity. The situation has resulted in the refusal of consumers to pay their bills and also because the bills are not transparent and clear. The report shows that Nigerian utilities get paid for only half of electricity they receive.
and that for every 10 naira worth of electricity received by the electricity distribution companies, those are the discos, about 2 naira 6 kobo is lost to poor distribution infrastructure and through power theft, while another 3 naira 4 kobo is not paid. 6 in 10 of registered customers are not metered, and the electricity bills are not transparent and clear. Well, it sounds like a complicated web, but the partner of Tax, Regulatory and People Services at KPMG Nigeria, Mr. Martins Aroge, will help us untangle this web. Good morning, Mr. Aroge, and thank you so much for coming on the show this morning. Thank you very much for having me. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. So what's your thoughts on the World Bank's report that businesses lose $29 billion because of power outages and the refusal of some customers to pay their bills? It, it's, it's not very surprising because um, the, the base of any successful business, um, one of the things that you would expect um, and you would think for a given um, if you want to run a successful business is that you would have access to power. Um, and if you don't have access to power, then you can have to source that through uh, alternative channels and alternative means. Um, it would probably be very inefficient, um, especially when you look at the alternative systems that we have in place in Nigeria today. So it's not surprising that businesses are losing significant amount of money um, due to uh, their inability to have access to regular um, and consistent power supply. So I'm here, I'm not very surprised at those numbers. Okay, Mr. Oroge, well, the, the privatization of the power sector was supposed to bring the much-needed solution, but, you know, now we hear questions on competence of the new private owners and whether they are the right fit uh, for the sector. What is required to, you know, achieve some measure of progress here? Uh, first of all, before we, we begin to talk about whether the investors are, are the right fit, I think we also need to consider what are the what's the environment which they, they, they have to work and, and 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 what are the structures with which they have to work and whether they've been appropriate and whether they what are the structures and the environment have also been right fit for the investors. Um, but in terms of what we need to do, I do I think the answer is very perfect. It's, it's investment. Um, the sector has been, has been in dire need of single investment for years. Um, there's been um, very 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 little investment in so upgrading. Um, the capital infrastructure that is necessary and required to deliver power to our homes um, in the way and manner that we would like and the way and manner that we would be comfortable with. And if we don't, if we don't make that right investment in the structure, then there is no way we would see the improvement we're looking for in the sector. Hmm. Well, we, we talk about investment, money has to be put in, and, and then we ask, where should the money come from? And then there's the issue of cost-reflective tariffs. Nigerians do not want to pay more without any visible improvement in the quality of service. So who, who will bail the cats now? Is it the chicken before the hen or the hen before the chicken? It, 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 it's a typical case of two situations, and, 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 and one would need to find a way to unravel. Um, now, the challenge, again, like you pointed out, is, is um, the lack of cost reflective ties in the system. Um, for years, these schools were, were made to sell power at a cost that was less than the price at which we were getting it from generating companies. Um, that's, not, that's not a sustainable model. Um, Nigerians don't want to pay more until they see reliable power. Um, and reliable power would only come when these schools have the ability to make investments in the infrastructure. Now, what you will typically will see is, or expect is that the discos which should be able to raise these funds um, from external sources. Um, but when you look at the, the, the status and the situation of the sector, when nearly all the distribution companies are in a negative equity position, which means that they had losses that have eroded um, the amount of capital they put into the business at, at the get go, um, then it becomes a lot more difficult to raise funding. Um, they then also have issues around tariffs. Um, and, and my two, and, and how we constantly have shifted the goalposts when it's, when it's come to both the major and the minor um, reviews of tariffs down the years. Um, that has also impacted investor confidence. Um, so if I was looking to put money somewhere, and I had an industry where I wasn't very certain of what government policies would be and how consistent they would be over time, I would be a bit reluctant to put money in. So it's also been very, very difficult for, God, for, for the, for the discos um, um, to also seek for external source of funding to make this investment. Uh, 
I am not sure that that, that that at the end of the day we can which we, it's fair on customers to say pay cost reflected tariffs without a necessary improvement. And that's what we try to do um, with the service based tariff, where the more power you get, the higher you're expected to pay. Um, but 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 again, the challenge still, still, still is still there. Um, are people actually getting the amount of power um, that is reflected in the tariff? So when we look at band A, where people, where um, people are expected to get more than 20 hours of power every day. Is that what's really happening? Um, and should, should those be classified as band A today, actually be band B, or maybe even band C, D, or E, uh, based on the actual facts on ground? Um, so it's a, it's a very, very difficult situation. Customers should not be expected to pay more until they can see an improvement in, in the quality of tariffs, I mean, quality of supply. Um, but that funding has to come in. So it, it has to be something that government needs to work out um, and find, find a way to put in place a structure that allows this disco access funding. And the CBN is already working on something like that um, um, to help the disco get, get some measure of funding to make the necessary investment um, in the sector. Um, the World Bank a few years ago also had put, put in place a program, the Power Sector Recovery Program, um, that was also supposed to address some of these issues where the discos were able to access some form of funding over a period of time with which they can then make the necessary investment in improving the quality of infrastructure. After which, when Nigerians begin to see that improvement, we can then um, begin to um, increase tariffs up onto the point where we can get cost reflective tariffs. So it's that funding, um, and government needs to be very much involved working with the CBN and the World Bank, um, as, we've all, as, as, as has been articulated in, in, program, in plans in the past, and ensuring that this can access the funding, make that investment in, in infrastructure, and then we can see that improvement. It's also something very similar that the Siemens deal um, is also expected to accomplish um, improvements in, in transmission, improvement in distribution infrastructure. Um, because, because again, if you look at the status in the, in the sector today, less than half of our generating capacity gets actually wheeled to customers. So if we can even have a bit the ability to increase transmission and distribution capacity so that we can even access all of our generation capacity today, we would see a massive improvement in the quality of supply from, from customers. All right. Um, how does the application of value-added tax in the power sector today impact um, tariffs? And are there ways to tweak this application and uh, subsequently uh, reduce tariffs? Yes, there is. Um, VAT today is the cost. Um, so when you hear that tariffs, the tariffs you pay, um, you say 50 naira per kilowatt hour, um, then you then add 7.5% on top of that tariff to get how much you actually would pay. Now, the question has always been, um, should we apply that additional 7.5% rather than, rather than pay it to government, should we pay it over to the distribution companies um, and then ensure that they, they, they invest that funds in infrastructure development? Um, over, over, over time, there's been a lot of discussions around how you can tweak that and ensure that you take away that cost from consumers and use it to set, set up a fund um, that these schools can then access and use for capital in, capital improvement in the sector. Um, sometime last year, government and labor also, also worked out some kind of arrangement where um, the VAT would be applied towards providing subsidy um, for, for, for low-income um, consumers. Um, but, but in terms of details of how that has actually worked, it's, it's still unclear. Um, so yes, there are ways you can work around the VAT question and see how you can apply that amount towards ensuring that there is some improvement in, in infrastructure. Yeah, but what impact does the computation of minimum tax have on limited resources in the sector and how can this money be better applied towards development of infrastructure? It's, it's, a, it's a very, very difficult situation. Now, like I mentioned, um, the distribution companies in Nigeria from time, from when they were handed over to private investors, have not made real profits. They, have, they all have, they've all made very significant losses. Um, but because of the rules we have in Nigeria today around the application of minimum tax, um, you still get to pay taxes even when you don't make profits. Um, for some distribution companies, their tax bill last year alone ran into billions of naira. And these are companies that are not making money. These are companies that we are saying today don't even have the resources to invest in what is very critical to ensuring regular and consistent power supply, which is infrastructural development. 
Now, if you take a billion naira of a business that, that isn't making money annually, you can imagine how that would impact the ability of that business to continue to survive, talk less of making investments. So the question is, is can government do something about that specifically for this industry? Now, we can say, hey, how do we guarantee that if we waive minimum tax for them, that they would spend that money in, in making investments? Maybe we, not, we may not be able to guarantee that. So is there a way we can walk around a system that says, um, when we get this money from you, we can then give you that money to make that investment and monitor that process to ensure that the money doesn't get spent on some other, 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 other items. But this money, um, when we give you that relief, is then spent on infrastructural development. But it's, very, it's going to be very, very difficult if we expect them to continue to pay billions in taxes annually, even when they're not making profit, and then still expect them to find money from um, who knows where to make investments in, in infrastructural development. Okay, um, how does the current net asset position of uh, the businesses impact their ability to actually raise um, new capital? Yes, now that's a very, very good question because it's, it's, it's like um, someone who, who has a negative um, balance in his bank. So, so, so he has a, 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 he's owing his bank and he goes to his bank and says, I would like to, to, to get more money from you. Now, the bank is going to look at him and say, hang on a minute. The last one you took, you haven't been able to pay. I don't see any way you will be able to pay. Um, so why should I give you more money? So that's the situation where these companies find themselves in terms of their equity position. Um, they've had losses that have eroded their capital position. So they are primarily in a negative equity position. Um, and, and that would always have an impact when you go to banks, when you go to um, investors, when you, when, you, when you talk to, to, to finance houses and you say, I, I would like to get a bit more money. Um, everyone's going to look at you and say, you are not in a position to, 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 to take money from me at this point, particular point in time. What's your plan, first of all, to get yourself to a reasonable position? And then it comes back to tariffs. Um, and then I look at the tariff situation and I say, um, the last time you were, there was supposed to be a minor tariff review, nothing happened. How am I sure that anything would change? And if I cannot guarantee that you'll be able to pay me back, then I'll be very reluctant to give you money. So that's the situation that the, the, these companies find themselves in terms of their capital position, their, their negative equity position today. Wow. Well, it doesn't sound like uh, there's a direct solution to this. Uh, it all sounds so complicated with a lot of things to factors to take into consideration. But we'd like to thank you so much, Mr. Martin Saroge, for sharing your thoughts with us this morning and uh, helping us to at least try to untangle the web between power financing and taxes. Mr. Martin Saroge is a partner, uh, tax regulatory and people services with KPMG Nigeria. Thank you so much, Mr. Saroge. Thank you for having me. So we now move over to the markets. Now, last week was good one. Uh, Eddie? <laughs> yes, five, you're right. Five positive, uh, positive sessions. That was great. We call it a flawless trading week. <laughs> <laughs> so we had positive sessions all through uh, the, the trading sessions last week. And that's the first time since, I think, late January where we mm. saw all five trading sessions positive. So it was a good one uh, for investors last week. The all-share index was up 1.27% at 39,301.82 points, while the market cap was at 20.568 trillion naira. But with the gains we saw last week, what should we be expecting in the market this week? David Adonri, a stockbroker at High Cap Security, joins us now to answer that question. Good morning, Mr. Adonri. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you. It's always a pleasure being with you. So with the positive sentiments we saw all through last week, what should we be expecting from the market this week? Last week, uh, investors' uh, confidence was high in the market, but uh, we can drill down into the underlying factors that uh, sent the market into a perfect session. Uh, first and foremost, Within the week, there was uh, a primary market activity in the bonds uh, market. And it's not unlikely that uh, a lot of the applications were not successful, and so monies were refunded to the applicants, which eventually trickled into the equities uh, market. So that was why we saw across board all the sectors of the market uh, gathered uh, momentum. 
and um, it is still possible that a large quantum of that money uh, inundates the market as uh, excess liquidity, which will be available to sustain uh, the demand for equities this week. Uh, secondly, a lot of uh, first quarter results uh, hit the market, and some of them were impressive. So when you combine these two positive factors together with what is happening in the crude oil market, uh, the tendency is there that the uh, rally in the market can a little bit be sustained this week. So for the sector yes, now, yeah, we saw the banking sector jump the most last week. Should we be expecting some profit taking this week? Yes. Possibly at the later part of the week, when the market would have uh, gathered uh, more momentum, uh, we can see some profit taking. But in the first part of the week, the, the demand is still likely to be heightened in such a manner that um, we might still see the rally continuing, you know, until the later part of the week. All right, Mr. Donnie, well, we'll just keep hoping for those positive sentiments. Have a lovely week ahead. David Adonri is a stockbroker at High Cap Security. And I will just move on with the market numbers now. Volume and value rose last week compared to the previous week as volume stood at 1.60 billion naira, worth 42.14 billion naira, traded in 19,507 deals. Now, the banking sector tops the volume, that's the top uh, volume and top value chart for last week. All the sectors we track were positive, with the banking sector gaining the most by 4.82%. Now, we saw some earnings from some of the Tier 1 banks last week, and so I'm sure that was what uh, boosted sentiment in that counter. Also, some investors were expecting to see um, such po positive uh, performances from other lenders. So they were just taking position in other stocks to see how uh, that plays out. The so consumer goods sector was also up by 1.05%. Industrial goods gained 0.50%. Insurance was up 0.40%, while oil and gas was also up 0.29%. The Onisa Securities market also closed positive last week as the NSI was up 2.69% at 785.15 points, while the market cap was at 558.09 billion naira. We saw about 81 million units worth 1.55 billion naira traded in 269 deals. But for the fixed income and currencies market, let's talk to Dimeji Obasa. Uh, in the Treasury Sales Department of Access Bank. Good morning, Dimeji. Thank you for joining us on the program. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So what's your outlook for the fixed income and the currencies market this week? What should we be expecting? Uh, so on the fixed income side, uh, the general sentiment across the market is bearish. Um, a lot of people, a lot of market participants are looking uh, or expecting rates to continue to turn upwards. So they're looking to exit their current position in the hopes of, uh, you know, taking on new positions or recovering whatever short positions that they may have at higher rates. Um, recall last week that there was a bond auction as well as an OMO auction. Uh, this week, there's going to be on the on the Treasury bill side, there's going to be a primary market auction as well as an OMO auction on Wednesday and Thursday, respectively. Uh, we expect that, particularly on the long end, that's for the three to four day on the primary market auction, we expect that rates will uh, trend higher. Uh, the last three auction rates have been increasing. Uh, in one. However, the mid and short term of the 90 and 180 day bills have you know, had stable rates. Uh, still on the home side, uh, we expect that the uh, long end or the longer maturity on the home auction would typically uh, have, we expect to have a stable rate while the mid and short term probably may have a reduction in the rates. Uh, so that's what it is across, uh, you know, bonds and bills. Typically, we expect the rate to go higher across board. And, you know, this is as a result of a lot of the bearish sentiment that market participants have and also the reduced uh, market liquidity on the money market side. All right, Obasa. Well, thank mm -hmm. you for giving us those updates. Have a lovely week ahead. Dimeji Obasa is in the Treasury Sales Department of Access Bank. Well, the bond market continued its bearish run yesterday or last week. Uh, so we'll just look and see what happened in the market this week, Ini.
Yeah, we certainly will and hope that uh, like last week, the overflow from the fixed income market will spill some good news into the equities market. Well, thank you so much, Eddie. Well, we'll take a break now. When we come back, we'll head to London. You're welcome back. We're now head to London where Juliana is waiting by. Hello, good morning, Juliana. I hope you had a restful weekend. I did. Thank you, Winnie. Good morning. Good morning. So the pubs, the cafes, the restaurants in Wales can reopen from today. And also, the travel restriction has been, see, has been eased, allowing trips to other parts of the UK for non-essential reasons. It must be an exciting Monday morning. Yeah, it is. It would be an exciting day uh, for people in Wales who haven't been able to meet up with uh, their family or loved ones uh, for a pint of beer or uh, for some dinner. They can do so today. Um, devolved administrations from across the United Kingdom have, um, in some respects, ha had their own uh, path out of lockdown. So two weeks after um, non-essential stores were opened in England, this is going to be the case in Wales today. I think about a fifth of their population have received a full COVID vaccination. So they're well on their way uh, to, uh, you know, implementing a vaccination programme similar to what we're seeing in uh, centre government. So this is a great day, as well as the outdoor hospitality, theme parks, zoos and other um, uh, sporting venues outside will be able to open. So, yeah, this is a great way. And they are on track uh, for indoor uh, hospitality dining on the 17th of May, which is the flag mark for the rest of the country too. And another good news is uh, the prediction that the economy, the UK economy, will grow at fastest rates since the Second World War. Does this come as a surprise and how is that news being received? Well, yes and no. Uh, last year, we know that uh, the British economy shrank by 9.8%. This was uh, the fastest contraction for any other G7 nation. Pretty embarrassing uh, for Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Chancellor Rishi Shunak. A lot of people said we could have handled uh, the pandemic last year a lot better. So in January, the EY Item Club predicted that the bounce back in 2021 would be about 5%. Uh, They've increased that this morning to about 6.7%. And there are various reasons. One is the fact that in March um, we have that spring budget and a lot of uh, these subsidy schemes that have kept the economy ticking will continue uh, to September. One of the most important for some is the furlough scheme. Uh, so basically uh, the government paying for people to stay at home. Of course as well you can't talk about COVID without talking about the successful vaccination program here in London and in here in the UK. And of course as well there's so much uh, pent up consumer demand. We've been speaking about the PMI numbers uh, for Q1, all indicating uh, that, uh, you know, uh, consumers have got used to uh, services uh, being online and, and they're still uh, dishing out their money uh, to pay uh, for them. So with the pent-up demand, the vaccination uh, rollout programme and other contributing factors, EY Item Club, do predict that eventually, yes, there could be a 6.7% expansion of the British economy this year. Great one. Well, up to 40% of UK solar farms were built using panels from leading Chinese companies. And the issue of forced labor comes into the discussion. Tell us more about that. Well, yeah, um, this is a part of a Guardian investigation. The Guardian is a left-wing uh, newspaper here in the UK. They've been looking at uh, the Ministry of Defence and other British uh, companies who use contractors in China um, to uh, create solar panels. Of course, we are trying to transition to a much cleaner, greener economy. So we have been using solar a lot more. Um, one of uh, the main components of these solar panels is polysilicon. China is the world's leader in creating these. And the Guardian investigation points that a lot of uh, these polysilicon um, components are being made in uh, Uyghur uh, camps. Um, last week, uh, the, the, the British um, House of Parliament overwhelmingly voted uh, to consider what's happening to the Muslim-majority Uyghur community as a genocide. Uh, so the investigation and the findings uh, by The Guardian are quite stark. Uh, the fact that they believe that a lot of these solar panels that are being created in China are being uh, done uh, via forced labour. There is a very brief um, uh, 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 soundbite that I can quickly read from you. This 
this is a statement by a government spokesperson that we have, saying that we're thoroughly investigating recent allegations of forced labour in solar panel supply chains. In January, we announced a comprehensive package of measures to help ensure no UK organisations are complicit in the serious human rights violations being perpetrated against the Uyghurs and other minorities in Xinjiang. And so, yes, very serious findings if the British government are on one hand calling it a genocide and on the other hand using this slave labour um, perpetuated by this genocide to create solar panels. I'm sure we'll hear more about that later on in the week. Sure, we'll be looking forward to that. Well, uh, that's where we say thank you so much, Juliana. I'll talk to you later on in the afternoon. Thank you, Eni. All right, so we head over to the crypto market now with Laddie Williams. Yeah, Eni. Very dramatic market. Uh, we have uh, early morning uh, trade. Bitcoin dipped to about $47,000 and immediately recovered back to about 53000 It's uh, a ding-dong market we're having this morning. Uh, 24 hour volume, $160.69 billion, uh, up about 54.92%. Bitcoin dominance at 50.08%, down 0.93% uh, this morning. Uh, price of Bitcoin... 52,900, about 6%, 24 hour 58.018 billion dollars. Uh, let's talk to Solomon Amunde now uh, to get more insight. Hello, Solomon. Good morning, good morning, Larry. Good morning, Solomon. Yeah, quite a dramatic uh, morning for Bitcoin. Dipped to about 47,000, then immediately recovered. Is the bull market back or is it just a bounce? Actually, we're still in the bull market. If you zoom out of the charts, you'll notice that the bull market is still very much on. We're just having very minor corrections. And so far, so good. We have seen almost 28% correction, going to 30%. That's from the all-time high of 64,000. So as long as we're still in the range of 25 to 35% correction, we are totally fine. So long term, let's say later this week, when the current features expires, I expect it to still make a retest to like $44,000. Okay, so um, how are you playing the market right now? Yeah, so far so good. I've been trading sideways between 48000 down to 53000 or up to 53000 And I've kept a very tight stop loss, less than 1% stop loss, and it's just side trade and swing trades, nothing much. Okay, what's your um, outlook for Bitcoin's price this week? Yeah, my advice to traders is don't go in hard on the market yet. Wait to get a confirmation. If we break 54,000, then you can go long and put a tight stop loss to exit at 57,000. So we might go up to fill the CME gap at $61,000, then after which we might still dive down to $50,000. So everyone needs to make it up their stop loss this week. Okay. All right, Solomon, thank you so much. Yeah, so price of Ethereum, $2,476, up 12% this morning, 24 hour 40.191 billion. The top alt by market cap doing well. BNB up there at 10%, $544 from that pullback. And we have ADA Cardano up 10%. Uh, Polkadot, $32, up about 10%. XRP, uh, the biggest gainer uh, on the top alts now. Uh, up about 13.53% uh, and $1.20. Uh, cents. Top five gainers, we have Matic, 34% up. Uh, UMA, up 24%. Uh, Pancake Swap, $34, up 23%. Aave, Aave is up 21%. Uh, top losers, we have Nano, pulling back there, down about 6%. Dogecoin, Dogecoin still on that major pullback from about 41 cents. It's down about 4%. So, Ine, that's how the market is looking this morning. Well, interesting. Bitcoin going from 47 to 52,900. Massive. Just, wow, massive yeah. move there. Well, that's where we'll draw the cotton on the program for this morning. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Amy John Mekwa. And I'm Laddie Williams. Thank you for watching.